Hello, my name is Michael Dowd, and this is the longest video I've ever created. It has the most content. I have tons of scholarship, basically all that I've been studying over the last really 30 years, but especially the last nine years related to abrupt climate change, the rise and fall of civilizations, and how to stay inspired, how to stay on purpose in the midst of really trying and challenging and depressing and overwhelming times. And so the first video was a 30 minute video that was essentially a, an appetizer. And that's what you might wanna encourage other people to watch if you wanna introduce them to this material. The second one was 50 minutes long, my mid-sized meal version. And this one I'm considering my all you can eat version. It has everything that I think is important for somebody to understand our predicament, how we got here, what's unfolding and why, and then how to have the inner resources and relational resources to do well in really difficult times. I hope you find this as helpful as I found it to record. Thank you. 10 inevitables. Post doom, no gloom. My name is Michael Dowd and I'm recording this on February 22nd of 2022. This is the longest version. I call it my all you can eat buffet version. I've got an appetizer, half hour, mid-sized meal, 49 minutes, and this one will be the longest video I've ever done. Actually, it's, I'm throwing in the whole kit and caboodle. So I suggest that this 10 inevitables that I'm talking about here is contra what Kevin Kelly talks about in his book, The Inevitable, understanding the 12 technological forces that will shape our future. His thesis is this. Much of what will happen in the next 30 years is inevitable, driven by technological trends that are already in motion. And I suggest that the 10 inevitables I'm talking about actually override and because the inevitables that he's talking about are driving these 10. So I think that the future will look very different 30 years from now if humans even exist uh, than what Kevin Kelly thinks. Here's my thesis. Confusion and collective insanity reign without a life-centered view of ecology, energy, and history. Enthralled by gee whiz technology and blind to 10 collapse-related inevitabilities, we stumble into a future of ecological and societal certainties that most people cannot see or will vehemently deny. And so that's what I'm going to focus on, are 10 collapse-related inevitabilities that I suggest are ecological and societal certainties. And they ought to be undeniable, except that most people will want to at least deny these. So let's take a look at denial. Denial is the largely unconscious habit of thought, whereby we refuse to accept the reality of things that are bad or upsetting, or that challenge our worldview, our legacy, how we live, what is required of us, and or our feelings of self-worth or superiority. Denial is also the, the instinctual impulse to reject or discount information that calls into question our hopes, assumptions, or expectations about the future. We all have denial instincts. I do, you do, everybody we know and love does, so we can have compassion for ourselves and each other. And denial gets a bad rap. Often it's just adaptive inattention as famous death worker, grief walker, Stephen Jenkinson speaks about, he says, inattention, that is not paying attention to the world's ecological state is well advised because attention to it mitigates against your happiness, your contentment, and your sense of well-being. Having a conscience now is a grief-soaked proposition. Whatever spiritual awakening may have meant in past times and places, if you awaken in our time, you awaken with a sob. So here are the 10, and then I'll go through them one at a time, much more slowly. 10 inevitables, post-doom, no gloom. Most people will have a hard time trusting how and why our civilization is collapsing. Abrupt climate mayhem, which is like 10,000 years of climate change in half a human lifetime, rapid two degrees Celsius or more, locks in biospheric collapse and extinctions. Tipping points already crossed will be falsely framed as still avoidable. Without assisted migration, love and action, and I prefer love and action to activism, most tree species will go extinct. 
Without urgent collective action, there will be dozens of nuclear meltdowns. As our biospheric and societal predicament worsens, so will our mental health. Most people will only reluctantly relinquish their faith in the almighty we. If you proselytize only the doom side of collapse reality, expect to be shunned. Most people will crave distraction and virtually anything that offers hope. And elite universities, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the mainstream media, politicians, best-selling authors will remain first-rate legal opium dealers. Now, why I'm doing this, why I've created three different lengths of the same material is because there are certain benefits to trusting what is inevitable. It's not just collapse awareness, but it's collapse acceptance. And even people on the lower end of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, no matter where somebody's at, these benefits apply, not in the same way necessarily, of course. But the first is clarity over confusion, compassion over blame, and love and action over activism. Clarity, compassion, and love and action, courageous love and action. It reprioritizes nearly everything around what matters most and what really doesn't. It provides a calm urgency to get complete with self, family, others, life, and legacy. It focuses attention on home, family, community, what's local, what's joyful, and what's meaningful. It offers both freedom from shoulds, oughts, have tos, and freedom for coulds, mights, get tos. Often an overwhelming gratitude for the gift of simply being alive, aware, and able to feel deeply, including painful things, and an expanded sense of self, an ex expanded sense of identity, and of impermanence and death as sacred. So I just uploaded just the other day, uh, post my latest posthum conversation is with Karen Perry, where she talks about the, the 15 gifts that she's identified as the benefits of collapse acceptance, of trusting collapse. I highly encourage that. So let's take a look at these one at a time. Most people will have a hard time trusting how and why our civilization is collapsing. Now I'm gonna actually spend probably three times the amount of time on this one than the others, not all the others, but than any one, because how and why are two di very different things. How, there's no debate on. The why, most people are utterly clueless about. And so that's what I'm gonna spend a lot of time on. Now, one of my dearest and most cherished colleagues is Nate Hagens. He teaches a course with DJ White. He actually teaches the course at University of Minnesota but they co-created the course called Reality 101. And this diagram actually is a, a diagram of Energy 101, the trophic cascade, because of course, the plants eat the sunlight, the herbivores eat the plants, the carnivores eat the herbivores. And it turns out that the higher you are, the more vulnerable you are. That's why in past extinctions, it's usually the apex predators and the carnivores that go out first. So their program really focuses on ecology, energy, and history. And that's what almost all of my programs do too. And they just published this book, Reality Blind, Integrating the System Science Underpinning of Our Collective Futures. But there's one thing they don't go into that I'll be going into in depth here, which is you can't understand history if you don't understand the role of religion, life ways, in ensuring sustainability. You'll be completely confused about sustainability if you're not aware of that. And most people I've found are not aware of that. So the first thing we need to do is demythologize faith. Your God is whatever you put your faith or trust in. It's your ultimate concern. If technology or the market is your ultimate concern, if progress is your ultimate concern, that's your God. And this isn't just Michael Dowd saying this, arguably the most significant and influential theologian of the 20th century, Paul Tillich, famously identified faith as your ultimate concern. Thomas Berry, my great mentor, said, we are talking only to ourselves. We are not talking to the rivers. We are not listening to the wind and the climate. Most of the disasters that are happening now are a consequence of that spiritual deficit. He could have said of that religious failure. This is fundamentally a religious issue, and you'll see why. 
I go into great depth. I spend actually a 70 minute program called Sustainability 101. Indigenuity is not optional. And then an 80 minute program called God with the earth emoji, because I'm not talking about anything supernatural or otherworldly. I'm talking about reality with a personality. God, owning our error, accepting our fate. And then I've also done two smaller programs, shorter programs. My God, what have we done? And then True Sustainability, a sermon I delivered. And I'll explain the green clergy shirt in a minute. The truth, it has been said, will set you free. But first, it'll piss you off. And so what I'm about to cover, I guarantee will irritate atheists and religious people equally. <laughs> So how and why is our civilization collapsing? Well, this little book, 75-page book by William Ophuls called Immoderate Greatness, Why Civilizations Fail. In 75 pages, I've recorded the whole thing. It's available up on SoundCloud. But he takes a library of research, scholarship, on why civilizations fail and sums it up in 75 short pages. It's absolutely fabulous. And notice the title, Immoderate Greatness. Because how civilizations fail is ecological overshoot of carrying capacity. That everyone knows, or at least everybody that's related to climate and ecology and the, the rise and fall of civilizations. Ecological overshoot of carrying capacity. But why? In secular language, it would be anthropocentric, that is human-centered hubris. But in religious language, in mythic language, it would be human-centered idolatry. And Indigenous peoples refer to both of these as wetiko. It's a, it's a sickness of the mind, a sickness of the heart. But what I want to focus on here is idolatry. Because idolatry, what the heck am I meaning? Well, take this quote. Growth economics is not science. It's an idolatrous religion. Now, that's the kind of thing I say all the time. But this is from Herman Daly, World Bank senior economist from 1988 to 94. I just actually learned this in an interview that he had with Nate Hagens just a couple of weeks ago. The, the granddaddy of ecological economics, speaking about demonic economics or idolatrous religion is what growth economics is. What? Like what? I love this cartoon. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. <laughs> and this one. And so while the end of the world scenario will be rife with unimaginable horrors, we believe that the pre-end period will be filled with unprecedented opportunities for profit. So here's the actual quote, growth economics is not science, it is an idolatrous religion. It is not science because it flies in the face of the first and second laws of thermodynamics and ignores ecology. It is idolatry because it conceives of mankind as an all-powerful creator rather than as a creature subject to limits. And again, this is from Herman Daly, who's the granddaddy of ecological economics. The first law of life is limits. Carrying capacity is the ecological concept meaning there's a limited amount that we can take from the living world and a limited amount that we can release in terms, of, in terms of waste before the system starts breaking down. I call it grace limits in mythic terms or religious terms. There's a limit to how much we can take or how much waste we can exude before we lose the grace of the biosphere of the living world. Now, Loyal Rue is one of the leading philosophers of religion alive today. He's published a number of books. One of them is called Religion is Not About God. And what he means is that religion is about our relationship to reality. And yes, reality has been personified as the various gods and goddesses. But if religion is doing its job, it's to help us live in right relationship to what's fundamentally, undeniably, and inescapably real. I love this quote. He says, the most profound insight in the history of humankind is that we should seek to live in accord with reality. Indeed, Living in harmony with reality may be accepted as a formal definition of wisdom. If we live at odds with reality, foolishly, we will be doomed. But if we live in proper relationship with reality, wisely, we can be saved. Now, Loyal Rue is a religious naturalist, like my wife and I are, and so he's not meaning anything otherworldly by we can be saved. I've delivered two TEDx programs, and the first one was on one of the reasons 
that keep us from living in right relationship to reality, which is our mismatched instincts and the fact that we live in a world of super normal stimuli. This was on evolutionary psychology and brain science. The second one I delivered about eight years ago was called Reality Reconciles Science and Religion. And about a week before the event, they had on their website, Reverend Michael Dowd Reality, colon, Reconciles Science and Religion. So I told them they had the colon in the wrong place. But I said, I got to tell you, I like this Reverend Reality thing. And they said, well, we do too. And I, my publicist said, Bill Nye, the science guy, Michael Dowd, Reverend Reality, we're running with this thing. So I got a green clergy shirt, and now this has become my regalia. I've become Reverend Reality. In fact, one of my YouTube channels is titled Reverend Reality. I love this quote from Wittgenstein. The limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Turns out nature is nested. We're made up of smaller nested realities. We're part of larger nested realities, the microbiome, individual ecosystem, and so forth. But time is also nested. The past isn't behind us. It's not to our left or right. The past is inside of us. That's what DNA is. In fact, I heard a physicist one time say, you know, do you want to know where the beginning of the universe was? Put your hands like this, right there. 13.82 billion years ago, right there was where the universe began. Because, <laughs> of course, everything began from one spot. So reality in both time and space is nested like nesting dolls. But here's the thing, how we name it is an existential issue. If our name for this reality, what we call the biosphere in secular language, doesn't evoke humility, if, it, if, it, if our name for that reality helps us to have a hubris or arrogant way, we're doomed. Because we're in the middle. And we're made up of smaller creative realities like our microbiome. And we're part of a biosphere that we depend upon in every conceivable way. So what I call primary reality is everything inside us and everything outside us that we don't exist without. Martin Buber, the famous Jewish theologian, said in his book, I and Thou, that we cannot survive. Humanity will not survive having an I-it relationship to what I'm calling primary reality. And that's what we've been doing with this mechanistic worldview. This last 500 years, we've been thinking of the universe as a complex clock. So God becomes trivialized as a clockmaker outside a clockwork universe. And if you believe in the clockmaker, you're a theist. And if you disbelieve in the clockmaker, you're an atheist. And both sides tend to treat the biosphere as an it to be exploited. Crazy. So primary reality must be treated as primary. I would suggest that every truly sustainable culture, no matter how different they were, had an eco-theo worldview. That is, the ecos was related to as divine, and the theos, the world of spirit, was infused, embodied, incarnate, embedded within the living world. It's what sometimes is known as a kin-centric worldview. Gaia would be good enough, except if you have a concept of God that's outside, then Gaia isn't enough. A fundamental law of sustainability relate to the larger body of life as divine or perish. Or a more indigenous way of saying it, relate to the community of life as kin, or perish. Daniel Wildcat, a Native American elder, says, we live among relatives, not resources. And then Thomas Berry said something along similar lines, the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. The environment, after all, is not our surroundings. It's our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. So in all of my programs, whether I spell God G earth emoji D or the old English variety, which is G O D D E God, it's gender neutral. And a lot of feminists and Catholic nuns have been starting to use it that way. It sounds the same God, but visually you immediately know that you're not talking about some supernatural entity. So God spelled either way, what I'm meaning is reality with a personality, not a person outside reality. Now, I can usually count on some philosophy major in college to try to trip me up and say, well, what do you mean by reality? And I love Philip K. Dick's definition. Reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. And whatever else is real to that degree, time is real, whether we believe in it or not, and nature is real, whether we believe in it or not. And humans need to live in right relationship with the past, right relationship with the future, and right relationship to the body of life upon which we depend in every 
conceivable way. So from this vantage point, what's a God's eye view? We're used to thinking of it as the view from above and outside it all. Well, no, this is a God's eye view of the world. The subjective experience of every creature is how reality is perceiving itself. This is a God's eye view of the world. So I want to talk about two vital distinctions. The first I've already been using, the difference between secular language and mythic language. And this is solid support scholarship-wise. Ian McGilchrist's famous book, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. And, and then his most recent two-volume set, The Matter with Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions, and the Unmaking of the World. Our, the different halves of our brain, actually, one is about helping us to understand reality. The other is helping us to, to relate to reality. And it turns out, if science is doing its job, it's to help us to understand reality. But if religion is doing its job, it's to help us to relate to reality. And it turns out, religion has been failing enormously for several thousand years. James Hillman, in his 1976 Terry Lectures, uh, which is what this book is, he basically says, you can't even understand the world's myths and religions if you don't understand our brain's propensity to personify. See, that's the essence of myth, is personifying, giving human characteristics to what's more than human, what's other than human. He says, loving is a way of knowing, and for love to know, it must personify. Personifying is thus the heart's mode of knowing. It's not a lesser, primitive way of apprehending, but a finer one. To enter myth, we must personify. And to personify carries us into myth. Now, he's not meaning by myth an untrue story. He's using it the way I am, which is a narrative like the way Joseph Campbell did, a narrative that puts us in accord with the nature of reality. If we don't understand our brain's propensity to personify, we can't understand religion. Wendell Berry understood this when he wrote, nature is party to all our deals and decisions, and she has more votes, a longer memory, and a sterner sense of justice than we do. Unfortunately, Conservation International and uh, Hollywood teamed up. They got the memo on personification, and there's about 16 of these nature is speaking one or two minute videos. I've regularly shown Julia Roberts speaking not about mother nature, but she's mother nature speaking. I highly recommend all of these. For example, climate has always been interpreted as either a divine blessing or judgment. We know this in every single culture. The creator, sustainer, destroyer. Here's the Hindu version. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. These make no sense if you think of them as supernatural or otherworldly beings, but understood as the personification of the creative force of the cosmos, the sustaining force of the cosmos, and the destructive force of the cosmos, they make total sense. So language, secular, and mythic, both that's the way our brains work. And cultures, the other distinction is sustainable versus unsustainable. Now that's a secular way of saying it. A mythic way of saying that would be faithful or unfaithful. I suggest that we suffer because we are ignorant of even the basics of ecology, energy, and history. And one of the most Important things I'm saying in this program is sustainable means faithful, unsustainable means unfaithful. And I suggest that virtually everything else that we say is either a footnote or a distraction. Because right relationship to reality is fundamental for all species. And yet words create worlds and our language morphs over time. For example, what do we call this? That which brought everything into being that which nourishes and sustains everything, and that which receives everything at its end. It's reality, right? Well, what we call reality, what we call nature, what we call the biosphere, indigenous cultures experienced in a personal, respectful, I-thou way, a reverential way. So what I'm speaking about is ecology as the heart of theology. And I encourage you to actually, this is a very long program, so I encourage you to actually pause, stop it for a moment, stretch, take a breath, and then come back. So ecology as the heart of theology. Now, I'm quoting a whole bunch of old white guys, some of them alive, some of them dead, 
And I'm doing that because that's who I've been studying, especially with respect to collapse and ecological overshoot. But my main mentors during the 1980s and 1990s were almost all women in the fields of Gaia, Gaia studies, deep ecology, bioregionalism. So Sally McFaig was very famous, still is, she's still alive, is an eco-feminist, eco-theologian. Miriam McGillis, a major popularizer of Thomas Berry's work and a uh, an artist and a bioregionalist. In fact, I named my youngest daughter Miriam after Sister Miriam. Lynn Margulis, I took her Gaia class at Environmental Evolution at University of Massachusetts Amherst. She was also a mentor to my wife, Connie. Dolores LaChapelle, amazing deep ecologist. And then Joanna Macy and Margaret Wheatley. So these six women have been absolutely profound in my life. I didn't want to give the wrong impression that uh, that women haven't been as influential or more so in my, in my thinking, because I'm quoting a lot of guys in this program. Also indigenous, traditional ecological knowledge, T-E-K, but also traditional ecological values. And Robin Wall Kimmerer has been profound. Her New York Times bestselling book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teaching of Plants. And then also most recently, Stan Rushworth, uh, who has been working closely with Dar Jamel, amazing indigenous leaders. Our fundamental problem is that we no longer listen to what the earth, its landscape and climate, its mountains and valleys, and all the flora and fauna of the planet are telling us. Again, the reason that we're not listening is because religion has failed. So here's the scholarship behind what I've been doing for the last nine years and this program. Five stages of awakening, climbing the ladder of awareness, Paul Traferka, dear colleague. Dead asleep, awareness of one fundamental problem, awareness of many problems, awareness of the interconnections between the many problems and awareness that our predicament encompasses all aspects of life. This marks my trajectory exactly. From the 1970s until around 2000, I had an ecological consciousness, but then in about 2000, I read several books that put me on a techno-optimist, human-centered direction. And so from 2000 to 2012, I was dead asleep. I was totally in denial. On December 3rd of 2012, I became aware of one fundamental problem, and it was because Connie and I watched this TEDx talk by David Roberts, Climate Change is Simple, the remix. Ryan Cooper added some music. It's so powerful. It just changed my life. Then in 2013, I became aware of many problems because I basically started spending 20 to 50 hours a week studying this stuff. In 2014, the interconnections between the many problems. And then in 2015, I read William Catton's book, Overshoot. I'll speak quite a bit about that throughout this program. And I became aware that our predicament encompasses all aspects of life. So I, as I said, spent 20, 30, 40, sometimes 50 hours a week studying for the last nine years. And over 12,000 hours of study, nine years of reading and recording dozens of books and hundreds of articles, always with the authors and the publisher's permission in the field of abrupt climate change, which is, as I said before, 10,000 years of climate change in half a human lifetime, ecological overshoot, the rise and fall of civilizations, and how to adapt and how to even thrive in the midst of contraction and collapse. There's a lot that's been written on all that stuff. And so these books, I'm not going to say about these specifically, you can stop this and look, but these have been the most profound influences for me uh, in this field. Uh, I've recorded all of them uh, or major summaries of all of them. Uh, just incredible authors. And so you'll find these books and many, many others on the Post Doom website. That's our main website. On the resources page, You'll see all these audios are freely available, 25 books, 150 articles, papers and posts, hundreds of hours of freely available audios and essays. These three uh, playlists I want to I want to especially point out, Post Doom Soul Nourishment, RIP, that's Rest in Peace, Homo Colossus, which is William Catton's term for industrial humanity. And then why technology won't save us or the environment. I highly recommend each of those. There's like 25 uh, audio files in post doom soul nourishment, I think about 100 in Homo Colossus, and then I think 20 or 25 in technology, why technology won't save us or the environment.
And so you can read what I say about these here and you can listen there. The two videos I've created that are trying to help us understand reality are Collapse in a Nutshell, Understanding Our Predicament, and Overshoot in a Nutshell, Understanding Our Predicament. So these, up until this video that I'm now recording, these were the two best introductions to understanding reality and then adapting to reality, because both are needed, post-gloom, deeply adapting to reality, and then beyond hope and fear, clarity, compassion, courageous love and action. And then the only attempt that I've made to uh, try to do both is basically this video that you're now watching. So we'll see how well I succeed at that. I'm a religious naturalist. I'm a sacred realist. This is my eco-theo credo. Reality is my God. Evidence is my scripture. The epic of evolution is my creation story. Ecology is my theology. Integrity is my spiritual path. And inspiring trust in reality is my mission. Now, to speak that last one in mythic terms, inspiring faith in God is my mission, but not God as an otherworldly being, God as reality with a personality, which includes the biosphere. In fact, I suggest that the ecocidal delusion in the religious and secular world is that God is either otherworldly or doesn't exist. I suggest that the theism versus atheism debate is a form of ecocidal collective insanity. You've got thousands, maybe millions of people that are debating whether or not God is real or whether or not God exists when the one real God, namely reality, personified or not, we've been living out of right relationship to, and we are now already experiencing consequences of biblical proportion. It's insanity. Mark Perkel uh, was a friend and colleague, died a few years ago. In fact, I facilitated his funeral. And he, he did a program for the Humanist Community Forum in Silicon Valley called Why Reality Needs a Religion and Why Atheism Isn't Good Enough. And he created a thing called the Church of Reality. And I encourage you to check it out. There's some little, some odd stuff there that Mark and I didn't agree with, but there's lots of genius stuff there as well. Because if I'm not a theist and I'm not an atheist, well, what am I? Well, I'm an ecotheist. Ecology is the heart of my theology, and I consider human centeredness, anthropocentrism, as idolatry. And if you want to know how I speak to Christian groups, then this video here is a good one. Because ecotheism transcends and dissolves the theist atheist debate by honoring the ecosphere and the cosmos as thou, not it. It fosters humility rather than hubris. It celebrates our personification instinct. It helps to evolve rather than deride tradition. And then it facilitates religion's evolutionary and ecological reason for being. I love this cartoon. Muslims, Christians, Jews, Buddhists, atheists, they all taste like chicken. And that's the shift from an anthropocentric or human-centered worldview to a life-centered worldview. So most people will have a hard time trusting how and why our civilization is collapsing. Let's say a little bit more about this. Good people are dangerous, and great people will engage in great evil when their God is not synonymous with reality, or when their map of reality is outdated by privileging ancient mythic texts over current evidential revelation. But good people are also dangerous and will engage in great evil when they hold the ecocidal self-terminating belief that we are destiny's darlings, masters of the universe, conquerors of nature, God's chosen species, the pinnacle of evolution, or Earth's smartest and most advanced creatures. Every so often, there's a magazine, usually an astronomy magazine, that asks you, are we alone in the universe? In fact, National Geographic, both in 2009 and 2015, had cover articles on this notion, are we alone? Are we the only advanced intelligence in the cosmos? Well, I suggest this is a perfect example of anthropocentric hubris. And the ancient Greek definition of hubris is the overweening pride of the doomed. Because we're surrounded by intelligence far more than ours in terms of ability to survive and reproduce over millions of years. 
I love this quote from Teddy Goldsmith, Edward Goldsmith, who was the founder and editor of the Ecologist magazine and uh, one of the leading thinkers in this world of why religion or life ways is essential for sustainability. He says, it may not be irrelevant to note that even very modest forms of life, like earthworms, dung beetles, and fiddler crabs, have no trouble identifying the real problems they must deal with if they are to survive. So Connie and I have watched this a half a dozen times. Uh, it's uh, one of our favorite movies, Don't Look Up. Most people don't realize, as Neil deGrasse Tyson said, this is a documentary. Because a comet actually is heading our way. We ourselves set it in motion millennia ago. But only recently have scientists, echoing long-standing indigenous warnings, charted its course and voiced the alarm. Its name is anthropocentrism, in mythic or religious language, idolatry. And these are the end times because human-centeredness, as opposed to life-centeredness, will prove to be just as unstoppable and nearly as deadly as the comet in the movie. So because I've used this term several times, I want to make sure that you're not thinking you know, what many people think. By idolatry, I don't mean bowing down to statues or believing in the wrong God. Idolatry is anthropocentrism. It's human-centeredness. And you've got secular and religious forms of idolatry. Idolatry is having an unreal notion of God. It's a divinity that's not synonymous with reality. It's failing to honor primary reality, the biosphere, as primary. We are derivative. It's taking primary reality, the soil, forest, water, climate, taking that for granted. Or it's having an ultimate authority that leads us to betray and condemn the future. I consider the three most pernicious forms of religious idolatry to be idolatry of the written word, idolatry of the otherworldly, and idolatry of beliefs. Idolatry of the written word is where you think our best map of reality is locked in time, frozen in time in some written text. Idolatry of the otherworldly is where you think what matters most is only outside time and nature. And idolatry of beliefs is where we privilege beliefs over knowledge, over evidence. But you have secular forms, idolatry of progress, idolatry of growth, development. Idolatry of human intelligence and agency. I'll say more about agency in a little bit. And idolatry of technology, this idea of man, conqueror of nature. I consider the single most self-destructive ecocidal thought form in human history. The evolutionary and ecological purpose of religion, like the reason religion evolved, and I suggest the religious necessity of science, is to ensure right relationship to reality. And again, I wish I could just say ensure right relationship to God, but nobody knows what that means because everybody's been using for thousands of years now, we have this, this trivial notion of God as an otherworldly being rather than reality with a personality. Now, I'm not the only one saying this kind of stuff. The evolutionary and ecological role of religion, the purpose of religion, and the religious necessity of science. Two of the leading scientists, non-religious scientists of the world, David Sloan Wilson and Edward O. Wilson, they're not actually closely related, but they've both written extensively on the, the fundamental positive role, the necessary role of religion in human evolution. In fact, David Sloan Wilson has a distinction between practical truth or practical knowledge, practical realism, and factual truth, or factual knowledge, factual realism. Practical truth is if you, if you believe something is true and you act accordingly, you get good results, personal wholeness, social coherence, and ecological integrity. That's what practical truth, that's, it's, if religion does its job, that's what it does. And factual truth is what science is all about, but if factual truth doesn't help us to live in right relationship to reality, then it's that it can condemn us. And that's exactly what's happened. And it turns out that in an evolutionary arms race, practical truth will outcompete factual truth every day. So the vital role of religion, life ways, is the way indigenous peoples think about it, in stable, sustainable cultures. I mentioned before, Teddy Goldsmith, the founder and editor of The Ecologist magazine for close to 40 years. And this is really, this is the essence of what I'm calling Religion 101 and Sustainability 101. You don't understand sustainability if you don't understand what I'm about to present. Because religion he identified as the control mechanism 
in sustainable cultures, meaning religion was that aspect or life ways was that aspect of society of culture that spoke with moral authority that the future will not be compromised by the present. If religion doesn't do that, no other institution in society will do that. But in unsustainable civilizations, religion downgrades to a mere coping mechanism. Because it turns out in the last, say, for example, the last 2,500 years, the, the axial age, these are religions, the, the great religions of the world emerged in cultures and civilizations that were already radically unsustainable. And it's not like these religions could have held to account the political and economic establishment that the future would not be compromised by the present. So religion downgrade to a coping mechanism. So in traditional, that is primitive, what's called primitive, but stable, faithful, pro-future societies, and Teddy Goldsmith wrote a whole book, and I've recorded the whole thing, The Stable Society, and also his magnum opus, The Way, an Ecological Worldview. I've recorded a bunch of synthesis and, and uh, overviews of that. But in fact, what I'm about to share is actually from the table of contents in The Way, that in stable, sustainable societies, technology is in accord with the needs of the biosphere. Settlements are in accord with the needs of the biosphere. The economy is in accord with the needs of the biosphere. Education, community, basically everything is in accord with the needs of the biosphere. So it turns out religion needs science and evidence needs a moral voice. And this can't happen, this won't happen when the biosphere is exploited as it rather than honored as thou. And this makes total sense when you remember the nested nature of reality and we are dependent upon our inner and outer reality, that's primary reality. So ecological overshoot, it turns out, is always fundamentally a moral and religious failure. And this is what most people do not understand. Good and evil. What is the role? These are not abstract. These aren't relative. Good and evil apply to our relationship to reality. Good is what promotes or encourages ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness, usually in that order. Evil is what diminishes or destroys ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. This is not moral rocket science. It's a life-centered, not a human-centered view of good and evil. It's a life-centered or eco-centric. Aldo Leopold said it well when he said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and the beauty of the life community. A thing is wrong when it tends otherwise. So sustainable means faithful. And again, this isn't just me saying stuff. These are books that I highly recommend and been profoundly influential. Robin Wall Kimmer, Stan Rushworth has these two, and he's got another one coming out soon. And Julia Watson, Low Tech designed by radical indigenism, but also Western authors, Teddy Goldsmith, I've already mentioned, and Richard Adrian Reese. If you Google sustainability, you're going to find a bunch of nonsense. They start with civilization, which is practically the definition of unsustainable. You got to read Teddy Goldsmith or Rick Reese or, or any of these indigenous authors to really understand the nature of genuine sustainability. In fact, Wild, Free, and Happy is his latest book. He just is completing it now. I've recorded the whole thing, uh, and it's, it's absolutely excellent, all freely available. But here's, here are questions that often get asked. Is genuine sustainable living even possible? Weren't tribal cultures just as exploitative and destructive as city-based civilizations? Aren't we just an ecocidal species? Well, the answer to those questions is yes, sustainable living is possible, and no, and no. And it's amazing. People often, those who are asking these kinds of questions, invariably trot out Paul Martin's overkill hypothesis, which is basically the idea, which is now accepted as fact, that the first time human beings show up in a landscape that they didn't co-evolve with the animals and they can kill at a distance, like with spears and spear tuckers, all the big mammals go out. That's absolutely the case. And Paul Martin was the first one that put that forward. But I suggest that Paul Martin, if he had a grave, he was actually cremated, he'd be turning over in it to learn that his theory, again, now widely accepted as fact, was being used to support the claim that humans are incapable of living in place without destroying the place. 
Paul Martin knew and spoke often about the profound difference between ecocentric, what I'm calling ecocentric and anthropocentric cultures or civilizations. And the reason I can say this with some confidence that he'd be turning over in his grave is that he was my wife's most significant mentor. He was a friend of ours. We stayed at his house several times. He actually wrote the foreword to Connie's book, The Ghosts of Evolution. And she delivered, my wife delivered the closing hymn at his memorial service, Bring Back the Elephants. So you can find this up on YouTube. So yes, I can say with some confidence that Paul would be turning in his grave if he thought that his theory was being used to support the mistaken idea that we can't live in place without destroying the place and that cultures didn't do that. Again, don't take my word on it. Ecocentric cultures versus anthropocentric civilizations. I'm just going to mention these. In fact, I'm not even going to mention them each one. I'm just putting them here. You can stop the video and, and look these up if you want. They're profoundly helpful on this point exactly. And then these are book length treatments, Red Alert, Tending the Wild. These are classics written by two indigenous people. And then Westerners, Eileen Christ, Abundant Earth, and Chris Ryan's Civilized to Death, The Price of Progress. So once again, I'm throwing a lot at you pretty fast. I encourage you to stop, pause, take a stretch, take a break, get a drink or whatever, and then come back and, uh, and we'll continue. So the first, most people will have a hard time trusting how and why. We've been looking at why, and now let's shift to how. And now for the rest of this program, I don't have anything that isn't uh, completely well known in the ecological world and in the rise and fall of civilizations, widely accepted, nothing controversial. Problems versus predicaments. If you don't understand this distinction, you miss a lot. Problems can be potentially solved. Predicaments can't be solved. They can't be fixed. They have to be adapted to. And Richard Heinberg very famously said, our fundamental predicament is not climate change. It is overshoot of which global warming is a symptom. Joseph Brodsky was a famous Russian-American polymath. He was actually teaching at some of the most prestigious schools in Canada and the United States, and he won the Nobel Prize in literature in 1987. And he famously said, you Americans are so naive. You think evil is going to come into your houses wearing big black boots. It doesn't happen like that. Look at the language. It begins in the language. So here's an example. We're used to thinking of civilized as good and primitive as being bad, right? Well, these quotes, we'll call that into question. Forests precede civilizations and deserts follow them. All of our exalted technological progress, civilization for that matter, is comparable to an ax in the hand of a pathological criminal. Civilization is a hopeless race to discover remedies for the evils it produces. The end of the human race will be that it will eventually die of civilization. The earth is littered with the ruins of empires and civilizations that once believed that they were eternal. So I mentioned before Immoderate Greatness by William Ophuls. Well, his next little short book, Apologies to the Grandchildren, this is the beginning. This is the first paragraph of this book. Civilization is, by its very nature, a long-running Ponzi scheme. It lives by robbing nature and borrowing from the future, exploiting its hinterland until there's nothing left to exploit, after which it implodes. While it still lives, it generates a temporary and fictitious surplus that it uses to enrich and empower the few and to dispossess and to dominate the many. Industrial civilization is the apotheosis and quintessence of this fatal course. A fortunate minority gains luxuries and freedoms galore, but only by slaughtering, poisoning, and exhausting creation. And I've recorded the audio of that as well, that whole book. Collapse, it turns out, is a feature. It's not a bug. It's a feature of all anthropocentric or human-centered civilizations. In fact, three years ago, the BBC came out with a uh, deep civilization series, an article by Luke Kemp called, Are We on the Road to Civilizational Collapse? Well, of course, he answered yes. And then he shows this chart of 88 ancient civilizations 
Now that's just between 3000 BCE and a thousand of the common era. If you look at before 3000 BCE, or if you look at the last thousand years, it turns out it's way over a hundred. And the 20th century historian, Arnold Toynbee said, great civilizations are not murdered. They take their own lives. And it turns out we know how. Anthropocentric civilizations commit suicide or ecocide in precisely the same way over and over and over again. And this is just the last 5% of human history, the last 8,000 years. We have over 80 examples. And this process typically takes between 225 and 325 years. There's progress, rise, boom, which is actually a process of overshooting the carrying capacity. I'll say more about that here in a minute and then regress, fall, bust. And this is an unstoppable process of collapse. We don't have any example in human history of any civilization becoming sustainable on the way down. It can't be done for very well-known reasons. But here's the interesting thing. What's our inner world? What's our emotional world? How do we feel? What are our expectations? Well, if we're born and we die in times of expansion of carrying capacity surplus, well, Hey, you expect your kids and grandkids are going to have it better than you, easier, wealthier, and that sort of thing. And if you're born and die in times of decline, in times of fall, in times of regress, well, of course, your kids and grandkids are going to have it tougher than you. You just know that. It's when you're born in times of expansion and things shift in your lifetime, that's what we call suffering. And that's where all of us are right now. So I say a lot about this book. It's the most important book I've ever read in my life. Nothing else even close to it. Catton speaks about our unfathomed predicament because the discovery of the new world and the extraction of fossil fuels led Americans and now all the nations of the world to have carrying capacity surplus expectations and institutions. And our predicament is that we actually live in a carrying capacity deficit world. So our institutions, our expectations, our mindset is one thing, and our reality is another, and it's global. It's a predicament. It's not a problem. Rarely do you find an entire thesis of a book on the cover. Carrying capacity, maximum permanently supportable load. Cornucopian myth, the euphoric belief in limitless resources. Drawdown, stealing resources from the future. Cargoism delusion that technology will always save us from overshoot growth beyond an area's carrying capacity leading to crash die off i've recorded this entire book again with the publisher's permission stuart udall writes a scathing critique of techno optimism in his forward to that book it's still one of the best things i've ever read on the topic and it was written in 1980 Paul Ehrlich, Derek Jensen, many people consider this the most important book of the 20th century. Climate mayhem, the death of the oceans, plant and animal annihilation, topsoil poisoning and loss, critical resource depletion, chemical and nuclear wastes, the growing gulf between the rich and the poor, economic instability and insanity, political polarization and conflict, the contracting of in-groups, the rise of totalitarianism and other isms. These are things that we activists often focus on, and yet all of these are symptoms. They are symptoms of ecological overshoot of carrying capacity, which is itself caused primarily because of how we define and measure wealth, well-being, and success. If we define and measure wealth and well-being and success, because we're goal-seeking animals, we'll have something, some goal that we're trying to attain. But if we define that in human-centered terms, in terms of, say, for example, the wealth of individuals or the wealth of kings or the wealth of you know, GDP or the wealth of you know, nations, no, those are suicidal. Those are ecocidal. It has to be life-centered measures. How well is the forest doing decade by decade? How well is the soil doing decade by decade? How well are the other species doing decade by decade? Ecocentric or life-centered measures of progress and well-being and success are the only things that are not insane. And these first three, climate mayhem, the death of the oceans, plant and animal annihilation, we're in the sixth mass extinction, at least the sixth. Some people say seventh or eighth. And these are all extinction level runaway mode. They're already out of our control. 
there are a number of planetary boundaries that we've already overshot. Even if somehow we could miraculously fix the climate, which we can't, there are half a dozen or more other planetary boundaries that we have already overshot. When we don't understand and accept overshoot, we invariably misinterpret or misdiagnose virtually everything important. This book by Tom Wessels, I've also recorded it, The Myth of Progress. He's got this great quote. He says, carrying capacity can be defined as the maximum population size that an ecosystem can support without being degraded in some fashion. Any degradation of the living world is evidence of ecological overshoot, if it's beyond what can be naturally healed. William Reese, human societies as temporally and spatially far flung as the Mesopotamians, Mayans, and Easter Islanders came to ruin mostly because they expanded beyond the capacity of their environments to sustain them. He's the co-developer of the ecological footprint idea. And I've had post-doom conversations with both of them, as well as Carl North and Sid Smith. I highly recommend these uh, post-doom conversations because they're all ecologically based and all of these people value William Catton's Overshoot as one of the most important books. And of course, the granddaddy, Paul Ehrlich. And I know, yes, these are all old white guys. I get that. But that's because we white guys have screwed up the earth so much that it's not a surprise that there's some of us that are trying to help people understand why we screwed up so badly. What is the nature of the society you live in? This is a profound question. Most people don't know the answer to it. The first 95%, we lived in basically stable, genuinely sustainable within nature's normal cycles and rhythms. It was pro-future and it was a sense of ahistorical. There wasn't any sense of history. You measured things by the daily and seasonal ups and downs. There were no human-made calendars or clocks and no sense of progress. Even technological change was very slow over long periods of time. In exploitative cultures, usually one to three centuries, 3% 3 of human history, we see expansion and growth, carrying capacity surplus, but also we see slavery, colonization, and much of what's being done is anti-future. And progress, at least for the elites, obviously not for the slaves, is not a belief, but an obvious fact. And then consequential. Usually the, the fall takes less time than the, the, the rise to greatness. The Seneca curve is the way it's often spoken about. We see carrying capacity deficit, a contraction, and it's a post-exuberant age. And wealth gap widens, and it turns out that unworkability and denial reign supreme. And of course, this is where we're at now. Ugo Bardi uh, wrote a book called The Seneca Effect, Understanding Systemic Collapse. Why growth is slow, but collapse is rapid. And he quotes Seneca, the path of increase is slow, but the road to ruin is swift. Peter Churchin, co-author of this book, Secular Cycles, and he also uh, wrote Ultra Society, how 10,000 years of war made humans the greatest cooperators on earth. And I mean, this is a long span of human history, and they see the same pattern of dozens of, of examples of rise and fall. And here's the pattern. I mentioned before, carrying capacity is grace limits, spoken mythically. And then we see overshoot. And what overshoot means is betraying the future. It means stealing from posterity. To use mythic language, it's being unfaithful. It's being idolatrous. So again, sustainable means faithful. It means safeguarding. You see, the first 95% of human history, 200,000 or more years, 10,000 generations. The essential stance of virtually all pro-future, that is ecocentric or kin-centric or life-centered, land-honoring, where the sense is that we belong to the land, not the land belongs to us. The essential stance in these cultures is that wealth and well-being is measured by the year-by-year, decade-by-decade health and vitality of the soil, forests, waters, life, and everything that the culture or society needs to survive and thrive. Unsustainable means unfaith. It means exploitative. And this is the last 5% of human history, the last 8,000 years or so, just 400 generations. We see this pattern over and over again. 
the well-being of the elites and ruling class goes up, what gets called wealth and progress, at least by them, and the well-being of the bioregion and the habitat, that is carrying capacity, real wealth goes down. And where that happens, that where the, that goes over, is overshoot. That's overshooting the carrying capacity. And again, this pattern, we have over 80 examples, is the common pattern, the most common pattern of human-centered or anthropocentric civilizations. So I consider this book essential for understanding all human history. If you only read one more book the rest of your life, if you want to under understand our predicament, I encourage you to read this or listen to it. I've recorded the entire thing. There's a fabulous little summary overview by Peter Montague, the entire book in three files. And then also there's five Catton interviews. So if you just Google SoundCloud William Catton, you'll get there. But I also consider essential for understanding the last 8,000 years. Jack Forbes, Columbus and Other Cannibals, The Wittico Disease of Exploitation, Imperialism, and Terrorism. This is, this is a book about evil. And there, there are other books that talk about Wettico. I do not recommend them because they reflect more of a Buddhist or New Age understanding. Read Jack Forbes or just listen. This 26-minute audio is a, an article that he wrote called Why Are People Evil? And I've recorded that, and you can get the essence of the book, but I highly encourage you reading the book. Also essential for understanding the last 8,000 years is Andy Schmuckler's Parable of the Tribes. And again, you don't even have to take time to read the whole thing. There's a one-hour audio where there's a review and excerpts from the book, and you can really get the essence of this book in just an hour. And then finally, Walter Youngquist, essential for understanding these last 8,000 years, Geo Destinies, the inevitable control of Earth's resources over nations and individuals. And then just recently, I actually was in communication with him just before he died. He worked on a revision because the, the original version was written in 1997, but then he updated and revised it. And uh, Charlie Hall, uh, the one of the Big Guns in Biophysical Economics and Richard Adrian Reese wrote a forward to this, and I've recorded the audio narration of 12 key chapters. And this should be available as, as a PDF, this new version, uh, within the next few weeks. So I spent an awful lot of time on this first one. Most people will have a hard time trusting how and why our civilization is collapsing. The rest of these won't take nearly as long, I promise. Abrupt climate mayhem, that is a rapid two degrees Celsius or more, locks in biospheric collapse and extinctions. Collapse is a process, it's not an event. When a gradual downward trend in biophysical health and well being goes into unstoppable decline, runaway, out of control, such as abrupt climate change. In fact, if you don't understand, collapse in this way, you won't understand that if you're in these redwood forests, they're in collapse. The only redwood trees that are producing cones are those that are artificially being watered. This is, we were staying in Humboldt County in California. Here's industrial civilization over the last 270 years. We see a gradual downward trend that goes into out of control decline, runaway, unstoppable mode. It's called the Great Acceleration. In fact, if you just Google Great Acceleration, you'll see. But it's the Great Acceleration of biospheric collapse. And here's seven decades ago and two decades ago. And everything we depend on, I'll say more about these in a minute, but literally every single system that human beings depend upon is not just in decline, it's in precipitous freefall. It's unstoppable now. But if you Google Great Acceleration, you'll find all these goofy charts, socioeconomic trends, looks like everything's going up. Earth system trends, looks like everything's going up. Well, it's true in terms of the science, but it turns out that emotionally we read it wrong. We think that going up means good. No. On the left are ecocidal trends. And on the right is, are, are measures of Earth system collapse. And so let's stand this on its head to get a better picture. It turns out that Gaia or the biosphere's health stability has been in decline for centuries and an unstoppable collapse for two to seven decades. This becomes obvious when you turn this chart around like this. Again, this is 72 years ago and 22 years ago. 
the great acceleration of biospheric collapse. The stability that allowed for the growing of grain at scale and allowed for civilizations, we have lost. It's no longer going to be there. We're not going to be able to support millions or billions of people based on agriculture. We've lost it. The ice, Arctic sea ice, Antarctica, Greenland, mountain glaciers, it's gone. The oceans, the plankton, the corals, the fish, ocean acidification and oceanic dead zones, and also uh, the deoxygenation and ocean rise. What's already locked in, what's already baked in is 25 to 40 feet of sea level rise. Soil, we're losing the amount of soil, the fertility of the soil, moisture, permafrost, all the methane coming up. This is already in unstoppable mode. And then mass extinction, plants, animals. And it turns out only two previous mass extinctions did we lose the insects and the forest. And we're now adding carbon dioxide and methane at a faster rate than happened back then. So I encourage you to stop, to pause, take a breath, <laughs> pour yourself a stiff one if you need to, and then come back. Seriously, though, take a break. This is a long program. So we've looked at most people will have a hard time trusting how and why civilization's collapsing. Abrupt climate mayhem locks in biospheric collapse and extinctions. Let's now look at tipping points already crossed will be falsely framed as still avoidable. This is inevitable. On my resources page of the post website, I have this, abrupt runaway climate mayhem, tipping points. And I, and I feature all of these, and these are all hot linked. Dr. Peter Carter does a presentation for the American Geophysical Union. It's fabulous, just recently done. Guy McPherson, Paths to Extinction. And a lot of people don't really get the importance. Guy McPherson was the first person really voicing most of this stuff way before anybody else was doing. And I'm telling you, his science videos, his science updates are fabulous. It's just basically showing how the what the papers are saying. He doesn't get the credit and the, the, the respect that he deserves. Bob Hunziker, Robert Hunziker, I had a post-doom conversation with him where we covered, we called it abrupt climate change, the world tour. And he took us around the world. And we looked at how abrupt climate change is showing up in all these places where mostly humans aren't. Fabulous overview. Meteorologist Nick Humphrey. He does a 27-minute YouTube video called Ongoing Abrupt Climate Change and Consequences, which is really a summary overview of his 16-part series. And I've recorded all 16 parts, and I definitely encourage watching this video. In fact, if you just Google SoundCloud Dowd, Nick Humphrey, you'll get there. William Reese, uh, one of the leading ecologists on the planet right now, his Canadian Club of Rome presentation. Again, this is very recent. Paul Beckwith, same thing. And Dar Jamal, Jem Bendel, Catherine Ingram, and Stan Rushworth. There was actually this living in the time of dying is, in my opinion, a must see documentary. Features Jem Bendel, Dar Jamal, Catherine Ingram, and Stan Rushworth. It's only 53 minutes long, and it is absolutely a must see. Now, I've also had post doom conversations with Nick Humphrey, with Bill Reese, with Paul Beckwith, and with Catherine, Jem, and Dar. And so I encourage you to check those out. And here are my post-doom conversations with Paul and Nick, and also Jennifer Hines and Kevin Hester. Kevin Hester's website is just chock full of all kinds of stuff. He's worked very closely with Guy McPherson. In fact, they did a podcast for a long time, Nature Bats Last. And then this little video, this is just a little 23-minute video up on Vimeo called Maz Alone. If you think that the billionaires are going to be able to save themselves in bunkers, Watch this video. You'll see it's a total delusion. Turns out that no matter what, no matter what, no matter how massive and effective is nonviolent civil disobedience, no matter who or which party is elected into or voted out of public office, no matter how many people change their habits, become vegan, stop flying, stop having kids, whatever, no matter how many so-called game-changing, artificial intelligence-driven high-tech solutions are tried, 
no matter how much evolution of consciousness occurs in the next decade or two, no matter how aggressively we try to shift to renewables or net zero emissions, no matter how many psychopathic or sociopathic CEOs and bankers are imprisoned, and no matter how many accords, what is pledged or agreed to, what laws are enacted. And let me just say something about that last one. Our summits, our agreements, our promises, and our pledges are worse than meaningless. Because abrupt, runaway, irreversible, out of control, climate mayhem, we can't stop. Believing that we can keeps us from attending to the few things that we need to do to avoid being geologically evil. I'll say more about that in a minute. But look at all these. These are all the cops, the conference of the parties. This is all the, our agreements and pledges and all this kind of stuff. And look what's happened. In the 1960s, carbon was going up 0.9 parts per million per year. In the 1970s, 1.3 parts per million. The 1980s and 90s, one and a half parts per million. 2000s, 2.0 parts per million per year. And then it's now actually, this is in the 2010s, 2.4, it's now over 2.5 parts per million per year. This is out of control. So no matter what, these extinction level tipping points are already in the rearview mirror. And this is excruciatingly painful to hear, but we have to hear it so that we can avoid being geologically evil. Loss of the world's ice. I mentioned this before. Dar Jamel's, in fact, if you only read one book on climate change, I encourage you to read Dar Jamel's The End of Ice, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. And then Peter Wadhams, probably the leading scientist in the world on the Arctic, A Farewell to Ice. Just this is an extinction level thing. Because when most of the Arctic sea ice is gone, the serious global warming begins. And you can learn about phase change and latent heat. You can Google that and find out more. Methane belching from the permafrost, the hydrates, clathrates, gas and oil wells, wetlands. This is already an unstoppable mode. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do everything we can to cap the millions of gas and oil wells so that we don't increase that. But nonetheless, this is already a tipping point that's in the rearview mirror. Ocean acidification, deoxygenation, that is the loss of oxygen, and at least 25 to 40 feet of abrupt nonlinear sea level rise. The great conflagration of the world's forest, already out of control. If we could stop emissions tonight somehow miraculously, if, well, if all humans died tonight in some super virus, we would still see carbon dioxide and methane go up every year and nitrous oxide because the, the forests are already in the great conflagration. I got that term from Kevin Hester, actually, where doesn't matter what, the forests of the world, the more forests are burning, the bigger forest fires, hotter forest fires. So this means emissions are going to go up no matter what we do. The loss of most species of animals and plants on land and in lakes, rivers, and oceans. We talk about the sixth mass extinction or the seventh or eighth. We're most likely on that list. Increasingly severe and deadly weather, storms, floods, droughts, hurricanes. Now I get that this is painful, but Oswald Spengler, one of the most significant historians of the 20th century, said when a civilization is in decline, optimism is cowardice. Cyril Connolly said something along similar lines, optimism and self-pity are the positive and negative poles of modern cowardice. And the answer to cowardice is courage. We need courage, says Kate Marvel, a climate scientist. We need courage, not hope, to face climate change. Courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. I love this. Meg Wheatley sent this to me, this quote from Hannah Arendt. Hope is a dangerous barrier to acting courageously in dark times. In hope, the soul overleaps reality, as in fear, it shrinks back from it. Catherine Ingram's amazing TED Talk uh, called Courage and Acceptance in Troubled Times. Highly recommend watching that. As the post-Doom conversation where she's in conversation with students, with her students, I 
kindness in harsh times. In fact, I just had a, a conversation with Joanna about a year ago uh, on to collapse well, Joanna Macy. And then Meg Wheatley, Margaret Wheatley, opening to the world. Her conversation with Terry Patton, who just recently died. What an amazing conversation this is. And then you'll probably not have heard Daniel Dancer, and I, I have this because I want to make sure that you watch this, an apology and a promise. I guarantee you, you'll be in tears by the end of this thing. I don't know of anybody who's watched it that isn't moved emotionally. It's a powerful. And I always ask the people, I've had 80 post conversations, and I always ask somebody at the start, you know, for those who aren't familiar with you, you know, help us get you. So you'll get all of these. So these are regenerative conversations, exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I've had 80 of them. I recommend them all. So without assisted migration, love and action, and I prefer love and action to activism. Activism is often still fear-based and judgmental. So love and action is where does love motivate you to be in action? So without assisted migration, love and action, most tree species will go extinct. My wife is actually one of the one of North America's leading point people in this field of assisted migration. Turns out that the difference between hundreds or maybe thousands of species of trees surviving or potentially surviving this century, and those same hundreds or thousands of species going extinct for sure this century will depend entirely on humans assisting them and migrating poleward. There was a major book that came out by Zach St. George, uh, W.W. W. Norton, top publisher, called The Journeys of Trees, a story about forests, people, and the future. It came out in June of 2020, and it features my wife, Connie, from the very first sentence throughout the book and her organization, Terea Guardians. What an example. And so she's also picked up the term from Robin Wall Kimmer, the Native American plant scientist and elder, helping forests walk is the indigenous way of talking about assisted migration. And if you want to get up to speed quickly, just look at the Wikipedia page, assisted migration of forests in North America. It'll, it'll really give you a fabulous overview of this whole movement. I love this quote from Paul Hawken. There is a rabbinical teaching that says if you're told the world is ending and the Messiah has arrived, first plant a tree, then see if the story is true. I suggest that building topsoil and planting trees while nurturing community is perhaps the most holy work that we can be engaged in. In fact, when I speak in Christian audiences, I say, if you don't find Christ in the soil, every other place you look for him is a delusion. So without urgent collective action, I suggest there will be dozens, if not more, of nuclear meltdowns. Because the limits to growth, published back in 1972, has this chart. And here's where we are in 2022. And you'll see things are going down. And this is inevitable. And there have been two updates. Limits to growth revisited, Ugo Bardi published in 2011. And then Tim Jackson and Robin Webster published in 2016, Limits Revisited. And both of these, and there's actually been one more too, show that this is exactly right on track. And it turns out there are 440 nuclear reactors worldwide, requiring us to assume that industrial civilization has everlasting life, has eternal life. Yet we are already 20 to 30 years into abrupt runaway climate change. So here's the 64 million year question, not 64 million dollar, but 64 million year question. Think about this. As industrial civilization continues to collapse faster and faster, how many Chernobyl or Fukushima-like or worse meltdowns due to wildfires, hurricanes, droughts, tsunamis, power grid failures, political instability or terrorism do you think are possible, likely? inevitable. Catton, in his final chapter of this book, Facing the Future Wisely, says that our best bet is to expect the worst. He says, only by assuming the worst and acting accordingly do we have any real chance of avoiding the worst. I did this program about a year ago, unstoppable collapse. In fact, Joanna Macy's in my conversation was specifically about this video that she watched and then we talked about it. 
Here's the thesis of that. The stability of the biosphere has been in decline for centuries and in unstoppable out of control mode for decades. This great acceleration of Gaian collapse is an easily verifiable fact. The scientific evidence is overwhelming. As I said before, all you've got to do is Google great acceleration. Evidence is also compelling that the vast majority of people will deny this, especially those still benefiting from the existing order, those legitimately concerned about the consequences of collapse, and those who fear that accepting reality means giving up. And yes, most of us find ourselves in that paragraph. The history of 80 plus previous boom and bust, that is progress, regress, rise and fall societies, reveals how and why Homo Colossus is destined for extinction. And again, Homo Colossus is William Catton's term for industrial humanity. Paradoxically, acceptance may be the only thing that can help us not make a bad situation catastrophically worse. Because I suggest that to avoid becoming evil on a geological time scale, we must minimize the deadliest of toxicity, nuclear, methane, chemicals, and so forth. And again, some of the methane we won't be able to, but there's a lot that we can do because there's millions of gas and oil wells that are leaking methane. Assisting plants, especially trees, in migrating poleward. And investing time, energy, and resources in all things regenerative. And learning from and supporting indigenous resistance and wisdom. And I, I focus on this. I've mentioned this because indigenous resistance, if you look globally, where biodiversity is being protected, where it's being preserved most fiercely is almost always in indigenous communities or where indigenous peoples have taken the lead. And Honor the Earth is uh, Winona Leduc's organization. I highly recommend her work as well as Nick Estes. His book, Our History is the Future, also available in audiobook. They're both available in audio. I recommend them. They're, they're leading indigenous activists in this field. And then permaculture, agroecology, indigenuity, regenerative agriculture, regenerative everything. I mean, regeneration is partnering with nature. It's protecting the soil rather than disturbing it. It's about diversity and honoring what's holistic. And I've had post doom conversations with David Holmgren, co-founder of Permaculture, uh, Denise Rushing, Joe Brewer, and Daniel Christian Wall. Each of them is a profound contributor to this field of permaculture and regeneration. And so I recommend all of these post doom conversations and their writings. In fact, Joe Brewer just came out just literally like a month ago, The Design Pathway for Regenerating Earth. And Peter Bain, The Permaculture Handbook. Now, there's many great books. I'm just recommending these two because I, I love these two brothers and I think their books are fabulous. So again, I encourage you to pause, take a breath, stretch, you know, go to the bathroom, whatever, and then come back because this is a long program and I encourage you to take these little breaks along the way. Ten inevitable. So here's, here's what we've covered so far. Most people have a hard time trusting how and why our civilization is collapsing. Abrupt climate mayhem locks in biospheric collapse and extinctions. Tipping points already crossed will be falsely framed as still avoidable. Without assisted migration, love, and action, most tree species will go extinct. Without urgent collective action, there will be dozens at least of nuclear meltdowns. As our biospheric and societal predicament worsens, so will our mental health. Now, this doesn't mean every individual, but what it does mean is collectively, that's what history shows us. In fact, Bruce Alexander, his amazing book, The Globalization of Addiction, a study in poverty of the spirit, talks about why it is, as Plato noted, that as civilizations contract and collapse, addictions and mental health issues of all kinds rise. In fact, I got this from Dave Pollard. He wrote a post called Cultural Acedia, When We No Longer Care. And he outlines, these other scholars outline, nine basic human universal needs that are true for all humans at all times in all cultures. First, obviously, is a habitable climate and healthy, non-toxic air, water, food, and shelter. The need to belong to and connect with 
a safe and engaging community, starting with attachment to one's mother in the critical first years of life. The need for meaning and purpose in one's life, including meaningful work. The need to be valued, appreciated, and heard. The need to feel secure about the future for oneself and loved ones. This doesn't necessarily mean optimism, but it does mean relative positivity about the future for oneself and one lo one's loved ones. The need for control and a degree of autonomy over one's life and work. The need to be in regular intimate communion with the living world. The need for a sense of place and home. And the need for freedom from chronic stress, financial, physical, etc., and the time and space to recover from it, including getting adequate sleep. Now, the first thing to know about this list of universal human needs is that they were all met in spades in truly sustainable, indigenous, pro-future, stable cultures, and most of them are not met in industrial civilization, for sure. So again, Bruce Alexander's work shows that at the individual level, addictions of all kinds ramp up, and addiction is primarily not a substance or personal issue, it's a sociological and cultural issue. But Rebecca Solnit's amazing book, A Paradise Built in Hell, the extraordinary communities that arise in disaster. So we can see communities coming together in truly heroic, soul-nourishing, compassionate, and generous ways. A couple of cartoons. This is fine. This is a rather famous meme. Welcome to Everything is Fine National Park. Quiet sobbing area next 1,000 miles. Oh, this is, this is tough. This young koala has a mental health problem. See, this is the whole field of eco-psychology, that our psychology is, cannot be divorced from what's happening in the outer world. And the, the foundational texts uh, in terms of eco-psychology that have influenced me, there's a lot of more recent stuff, but Gregory Bateson steps to an ecology of mind and then mind and nature. Uh, Ted Rozak, Theodore Rozak, Voice of the Earth, and his more recent book that he edits, and then Dave Abram, The Spell of the Sensuous and Becoming Animal. These are foundational texts in eco-psychology. And my two most significant female mentors are Joanna Macy and Dolores LaChapelle. And I consider both of these books in the top 15 books I've ever read in my life. World as Lover, World as Self by Joanna Macy and her more recent book, A Wild Love for the World. And Dolores LaChapelle, Sacred Land, Sacred Sex, Rapture of the Deep, Concerning Deep Ecology and Celebrating Life. I love this quote from Joanna Macy and her work that reconnects. This is a dark time filled with suffering and uncertainty. Like living cells in a larger body, it is natural that we feel the trauma of our world. So don't be afraid of the anguish you feel or the anger or fear, because these responses arise from the depth of your caring and the truth of your interconnectedness with all beings. Another really important resource in this whole field of mental health and adaptation, deep adaptation, Jim Bendel's paper that went viral. <laughs> Most academic papers are read by, you know, a few dozen people. This paper was actually been downloaded over a million times. I've had a post doom conversation with Jim Bendel and the Deep Adaptation Forum and the Deep Adaptation Facebook group. And also I've recorded not only his deep adaptation paper, but the, and the, the more recent version that he did in, in uh, 2021, but also so many other things. So I encourage you to check out these, if you like to listen to things, my audio recordings of Jim Bendel's deep adaptation work and his other blogs related to it. These two videos I mentioned before, post gloom and beyond hope and fear. But what I didn't mention is that there's really only one path beyond hope and fear. We don't like it. We don't want it to keep from bouncing between hope and fear back and forth. We have to go through the path of grief. There's no other way. I love this quote from Stephen Jenkinson. Grief requires us to know the time we're in. The great enemy of grief is hope. Hope is the four-letter word for people who are unwilling to know things for what they are. Our time requires us to be hope-free to burn through the false choice of being hopeful or hopeless. They are two sides of the same con job. Grief is required to proceed.
And then Joanna Macy, the depth of your grief is the measure of your love. You wouldn't be feeling grief if you didn't love and love deeply. So I recommend this, the Good Grief Network, a 10-step program to personal resilience and empowerment in a chaotic climate. My post-doom conversation with Laura and Amy uh, is just fabulous. I, I invited them to actually walk us through the 10 steps, which they did. The New York Times actually featured the Good Grief Network. This is just like two weeks ago. Climate change enters the therapy room. 10 years ago, psychologists proposed that a wide range of people would suffer anxiety and grief over climate. Well, skepticism about that idea is gone. It's by Ellen Berry, and she records it also in her own voice. Quote from Washington Irving, there is a sacredness in tears. They speak more eloquently than 10,000 tongues. They are messengers of overwhelming grief, deep contrition, and unspeakable love. This is a resource I recommend to everybody watching this twice weekly, actually two times a week, post doom, no gloom general, and then another two times a week, the post doom bloom woman circle. So you'll find all that information in the Zoom links at the discussion page of the post doom website. This is another video, a short video, new serenity prayer, emotional support for climate anxiety and environmental dread, just a little 25 minute thing. And, uh, you know, most of us are familiar with the Serenity Prayer. It was penned by Reinhold Niebuhr in the mid-1960s. God, life, reality. Grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. But a lot of us have never heard this next part. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. One thing that we can do is help other species. Connie, again, is involved. Here, here's what she's doing. She's spreading redwood seeds right here. This is Robin Wall Kimmerer's notion of helping forests walk or assisted migration. Action on behalf of life transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it's not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. And again, why I'm focusing on this is because there are certain benefits that only come when you're fully collapse accepting, trusting what is inevitable, clarity, compassion, love and action. It reprioritizes virtually everything, a calm urgency to get complete in all areas of your life, focuses attention on really what matters, what's local, joyful, and meaningful both freedom from certain things and freedom for other things, an overwhelming sense of gratitude for just the gift of being alive and able to feel deeply, including the difficult, uncomfortable feelings. And then this expanded sense of self or identity that you are the universe becoming conscious of itself. We're part of nature. We're not, we're, we're not separate from it or superior to it. Human beings grow out of the planet Earth in the same way that apples grow out of an apple tree. This is this, this identity that our bodies are the earth and also of impermanence and death as sacred. So as our biospheric and societal predicament worsens, so will our mental health. Most people will only reluctantly relinquish their faith in the almighty we. I suggest that a widely held belief that offers short-term hope but will soon morph into crushing disappointment and likely dozens of nuclear catastrophes is the hubris of the almighty we. What I mean by that is an ecocidal, it's a religious faith, but it's secular, a secular religious faith in omnipotent human agency. Here are examples, progress and development, biosphere management, climate restoration, which is another name for geoengineering, species level awakening, and the evolution of consciousness. These are all different expressions of this ecocidal religious faith in omnipotent human agency, the hubris of the almighty we. I love this cartoon. It's not too late to stop the worst of climate change if we all accept reality and work together for the common good. <laughs> We're screwed. And 
if we all, that's the key phrase, if we all, if we all become vegan, if we all stop flying, if we all stop having children, if we all stop driving, if we all just vote the right people in, all of these are expressions of this ecocidal faith in the almighty we. This is a very famous, this is just a four minute segment of HBO's The Newsroom in 2014. Uh, if you Google HBO Newsroom, EPA, MB Dowd, you'll find that I've got links to the eight minute version that I can't put up on YouTube because HBO doesn't allow me to do it, but it's my Dropbox folder. And you'll get there because this is a very famous clip. This is the most accurate portrayal of what scientists, most scientists actually know about climate, but never say publicly. And there's this incredible scene where the anchor asks this, the top scientist at the EPA and says, so it sounds like you're saying the situation is dire. And Toby, the EPA scientist says, well, no, not really. It, your house is burning to the ground. The situation is dire. Your house has already burned to the ground. The situation is over. And Mother Jones, about two months later, did a fact check on Aaron Sorkin, who wrote the newsroom, the climate science. And you know what they found? He's right. W-A-S-F. We are so, yeah, you got it. Again, the quote, as I mentioned before, that evil begins in the language, Brodsky. Well, here's some more examples. Our situation is dire. We're at risk of passing critical tipping points. If we all work together, we can still rein in rising temperatures. It's not too late to fix the problem with a green energy revolution. We're making progress in the fight against global warming. We can solve the crisis and get to net zero emissions. The window of opportunity for bold action is closing. Green technology, green growth can reverse climate change it's still possible to avoid systemic collapse. What if we were to actually tell the truth? We are decades into biospheric and civilizational collapse. It is utterly impossible to win the fight against climate. The window of opportunity for transformation never existed. There is no solution. And net zero is a fairy tale delusion. Green tech, green growth will exacerbate climate mayhem. If we don't all immediately fill in the blank, we're doomed. No, the truth, we're doomed. Now what? This is a New York Times bestselling book by Roy Scranton, as is his Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, which I've also recorded the entirety of. Because again, the reason this is so important is that we won't attend to minimizing deadliest toxicity, like getting the nuclear fuel rods out of the swimming pools into someplace like Yucca Mountain and other more safe spaces. We won't do that, and we won't assist plants, and especially trees, in migrating if we think that industrial civilization can continue. If we know that it's doomed, then we'll attend to this stuff. So... If you proselytize only the doom side of collapse reality, expect to be shunned. I know this one personally firsthand. And on the post-doom website, I have definitions of doom and post-doom in two different places. Here they are. And this is collective intelligence. I worked for about close to a year on these definitions with a lot of input from others. Doom, three definitions of doom, three definitions of post-doom. Doom is a common feeling of ugh or dread upon realizing that technological progress and economic growth and development are the root of our predicament, not our way out. Doom is a name for the anxiety and fear called forth when living in a corrupt and dysfunctional civilization causing a mass extinction. And doom is the midpoint between denial and regeneration with or without us. That's what life does. I sometimes call it compost theology. Life will regenerate with or without us. So doom, most people don't allow themselves to feel doom because they think they're going to stay in despair the rest of their lives. But fortunately, our brains, for most of us, don't allow us to do that. Doom is the midpoint between denial and regeneration. Because once you allow yourself to go through that door that says WASF, we are so, hmm, a whole world opens up 
of post doom. And you look back and you still see WASF, but more often than not, you experience it as we are so fortunate to be alive and to make whatever difference we can in a compassionate, generous way. Post doom is what opens up when we remember who we are, that we are life becoming conscious of itself. We're an expression of, of earth. When we accept the inevitable, when we honor our grief, and when we prioritize what is pro-future and soul-nourishing. Post-doom is a fierce and fearless reverence for life and relative equanimity, even in the midst of abrupt climate mayhem, a global pandemic, and collapse of both the health of the biosphere and business as usual. And post-doom is living meaningfully, compassionately, and courageously, no matter what. Number nine, most people will crave distraction and virtually anything that offers hope. And of course, where there's addicts, there'll be suppliers, elite universities, the IPCC, the mainstream media, politicians, New York Times bestselling authors will remain first rate legal hopium dealers. Don't worry, there's a lot of stuff on the black market too, but they'll be, these are the legal ones. And by hopium, what I mean is a comforting vision of the future that requires breaking the laws of physics, biology, or ecology, such as thinking that we can slow, stop, or reverse the great acceleration of biospheric collapse. That's a good definition of hopium. So for the last time, I encourage you to stop, take a breath, just stretch, and then come back. So these last five, as our biospheric and societal predicament worsens, so will our mental health. Most people will only reluctantly relinquish their faith in the almighty we. If you proselytize only the doom side of collapsed reality, expect to be shunned. Most people will crave distraction and virtually anything that offers hope. And elite universities, intergovernmental panel on climate change, mainstream media, politicians will remain first-rate legal hopium dealers. <laughs> the movie Don't Look Up includes Sir Peter Isherwell. It's fine. Everything is fine. Take a look at this. Hopium. Renewables, nuclear, wind and solar, electric cars, green economy, carbon sequestration, space colonization, fusion, carbon credits and taxation, biofuels, super batteries. These are all hopium techno hopium as i said now this will be the third time i'm saying this keeps us from religiously doing all we can to ensure as few nuclear meltdowns and other toxicity assisting plants in migrating and supporting indigenous resistance and investing everything we can in time energy resources in all things regenerative because even though collapse is a feature of all human centered civilizations there's no counterexamples that I know of, even though that's the case. We still find people say, but it's different this time. And I'm talking about major best-selling authors. Matt Ridley, The Rational Optimist. Peter Demandis, Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think. Factfulness by Hans Rosling, 10 Reasons Why We're Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than You Think. And then the best known of them, Steven Pinker, Enlightenment Now. The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. And Pinker has 75 charts in his book and in his earlier bestseller, The Better Angels of Our Nature. And, and he shows accurately how things are getting better for at least a subset of humanity over this time. It's never been better, at least for the most privileged. And he rightfully says that what has allowed this is technological progress and expansion and economic growth and development. But what he doesn't show and doesn't say is that it's never been worse for everything we depend on. This is overdevelopment, overpopulation, overshoot. Because no matter how you measure it, soil, forests, water, species, we see the loss of soil organisms, nutrients, groundwater and glaciers, rapidly and significantly expanding deserts, deadly droughts, heat waves, hurricanes, flooding, ocean acidification and dead zones, 
and deoxygenation, plastic pollution, nuclear wastes, toxic air, water, and soil, and the catastrophic loss of almost all other species. And of course, climate is caused by overshoot. And so what we need to do is call this for what it is. It's technological devastation and ecocide and economic growth and destruction. And that's what these prophets of progress don't get. Hooray for science. Well, yeah, if you look at the left-hand side. Now, how is it that Steven Pinker and these others don't see this? Well, I suggest they're blinded by their religion. I love this quote from Steven Weinberg. With or without religion, Good people can behave well, and bad people can do evil. But for good people to do evil, that takes religion. Now, what do I mean by Steven Pinker being blinded by his religion? He's a well-known atheist. Well, I'm talking about the secular religion of perpetual progress. Here's the creation story that's common, that's well understood. Stone Age, you know, cavemen, savages, primitives, hunter-gatherers. Things really pick up with the agricultural revolution. Farmings, cities, civilization, the enlightenment, reason, science, humanism, progress. The reason I have exclamation points is this is the enthusiasm, the breathless hype that these prophets of progress usually speak. The industrial revolution, fossil fuels, technology. And I don't know of a techno-optimist that doesn't have a Star Trek vision of the future. Globalization, space travel. I call this the techno-idolatrous ecocidal myth of man, conqueror of nature, the most ecocidal thought form in human history. Without a life-centered view of ecology, energy, and history, good people with the best of intentions will propose and support policies destined to make a bad situation catastrophically worse. Paul Hawken, he's been a hero of mine for decades. This book, Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. Well, the truth of the matter is we can't reverse global warming. Now, there's a lot of great stuff in this book, but some of it's just absolutely crazy. And then Mark Jacobson at Stanford, 100% clean renewable energy and storage for everything, the Solutions Project. And Bill Gates's new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, the solutions we have, and the breakthroughs we need. And then Michael Mann's latest book, The New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet. And then most recently, Paul Hawkins' brand new book, Regeneration, Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation. And one of the things I want to say about these authors is that they're great people. They're amazing people. There's some helpful stuff in all of these books, but they ultimately just don't get the ecological understanding and the understanding of energy and history. How have we defined progress in ways that are leading to ecocide? Defining and measuring progress in short-term human-centered, that is anti-future ways, leads good people to unknowingly cheerlead great evil. William Catton, I love these two quotes. These are the two most significant male mentors I've had. Human society is inextricably part of a global biotic community. And in that community, human dominance has had and is having self-destructive consequences. And Thomas Berry, the most difficult transition to make is from a human-centered to a life-centered norm of progress. If there's to be any true progress, the entire life community must progress. Any so-called progress of the human at the expense of the larger life community must ultimately lead to a diminishment of human life itself. And again, this makes total sense when you remember the nested nature of reality. Banking on technofix or political solutions will lead to catastrophic nuclear meltdowns and incalculable extinctions. Problems caused by economic growth and development will not be solved by more of the same. Indeed, our predicament will worsen. And understanding ecology, energy, and history undermines expectations that human ingenuity, technology, or the market can save industrial civilization. So back in 2014, there was this conference called Techno-Utopianism and the Fate of the Earth, Why Technology Will Not Save the World. And all of this is freely available. You can find the, uh, the videos and audios up online. 
Joseph Tainter's famous book, The Collapse of Complex Societies. And then Hausman's book, uh, Technofix, he and his wife, Joyce, Why Technology Won't Save Us or the Environment. Here are some of the main points that human technology that doesn't integrate with life's technology, nature's technology, God, earth emoji technology does more harm than good. It just does it over time. Technology in the context of ongoing economic growth does not promote sustainability, but hastens collapse. Most technological solutions to social and technology created problems are counterproductive. And this book shows why new technologies tend to be uncritically accepted, who really controls the direction of change, and why technology expands and accelerates ecocide. Planet of the Humans, a film that many on the liberal and progressive side hated, and there were all these scathing attacks. And all of the attacks missed the fundamental point. We are in ecological overshoot. And no energy system, even so-called green energy, is going to solve that or stop that or fix that. Bright Green Lies, a, a documentary that just came out recently, Clean Energy has a dirty little secret. Based on the book, Bright Green Lies, by Derek Jensen, Lear Keith, and Max Wilbert. Fabulous book, The False Promises of Mainstream Environmentalism. And then most recently, Alice Friedman's amazing book, Life After Fossil Fuels, a reality check on alternative energy. These books are the nails in the coffin of techno-optimism, techno-utopianism, techno-idolatry. So I did a little 24-minute video, I call it my Pinker takedown video, sane versus insane progress, a few years ago. And then collapse 101, the inevitable fruit of progress. Because remember before when I talked about demythologizing faith, that your God is whatever you put your faith or trust in, your ultimate concern. So if technology or the market or progress is your ultimate concern, that's your God. And remember Her Herman Daly's quote. Growth economics is not science, it's idolatrous religion. Techno-optimism quickly becomes techno-idolatry. Climate restoration, negative emissions technologies, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. If you want to know what some top scientists in the world think about this stuff, just Google carbon-sucking unicorns, and you'll see what Kevin Anderson and others are saying about this complete he doesn't use the word idolatry, but I do. Uh, it's insanity. I love this cartoon. How about if your generation spends less time studying how my generation destroyed the environment and more time figuring out a magical solution? So what does it even mean to be progressive now? If we're not hitched to perpetual progress, what does it mean to be progressive? Well, John Michael Greer's book, The Retro Future, Looking to the Past to Reinvent the Future, has got this great quote. He says, when you've driven down a blind alley and you're sitting there with your bumper pressed against a brick wall, the way forward, the only way to progress, starts by backing up. Revving the engine and hearing it labor and rattle as the gas gauge moves steadily toward that unwelcome letter E, or praying for a techno miracle, are not particularly useful responses. And I've done several sermons uh, on confessions of a re recovering progressive, and also on not the future we ordered. So I've done each of these, even though I use the same title for the confessions of a recovering progressive, and also for not the future we ordered, they're very different sermons. There's like about a 30% overlap and about 70% different. And Robin Wall Kimmer speaks about, again, the indigenous perspective of the time of the seventh fire, which is also the same thing, that we're at a fork. And if any humans are to survive this, we who are alive now need to go back and pick up and bring back into the present the gifts and the wisdom of the past. Very different understanding of what it means to be progressive. So let me conclude. Honoring your sadness and grief, climate grief, the death of expectations, the death of your sense of legacy, like maybe you felt good about what you've been doing most of your life and now it's called into question. Honoring your sadness and grief. Kubler-Ross stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, 
and acceptance. We've all experienced these. None of us are immune to these. And sometimes we spiral back and back and back again. And we don't necessarily go through it exactly in that order. But this is, this is what we're all dealing with. But Paul Traferka talks about finding the gift on the other side of acceptance. Because, of course, Kubler-Ross was speaking about the death of a spouse or being told you're going to die. So this is related to culture and our civilization and, and humanity and other species. So finding the gift. And then gallows humor. First time I heard this, I've been practicing it for a while, but Guy McPherson talks about gallows humor as one of the stages of grief. So here's a few examples. Please note, the post-apocalyptic fiction section has been moved to current affairs. I know you wrote this as a bleak vision of a dystopian future, but today we can sell it as a fond remembrance of the good old days. A few of us are going out after work to pretend it's not the end of the world if you want to join us. Being a dinosaur sounds kind of nice. No bills, no work, just extinct. And then on a more heartful note, ah, kindness. What a simple way to tell another struggling soul that there is love to be found in the world. Because no matter how educated, talented, rich, or cool you believe you are, how you treat people ultimately tells all. So again, just to wrap up the thesis of these three videos on 10 inevitables, post-doom, no gloom. Confusion and collective insanity reign without a life-centered view of ecology, energy, and history, and understanding the role of religion or lifeways to ensure genuine sustainability. Enthralled by gee whiz technology and blind to 10 collapse-related inevitabilities, we stumble into a future of ecological and societal certainties that most people cannot see or will vehemently deny. And that's what this has been about. So just to recap these here, so you've got them all on one slide. The first half, the first five, are mostly related to biophysical and ecological inevitabilities. And then the next five are mostly about sociological and psychological. Most will have a hard time trusting how and why civilization is collapsing. Abrupt climate mayhem locks in biosphere collapse and extinctions. Tipping points already crossed will be falsely framed as still avoidable. Without assisted migration, love, and action, most tree species will go extinct. Without urgent collective action, there will be dozens of nuclear meltdowns. As our biospheric and societal predicament worsens, so will our mental health. Most people will only reluctantly relinquish their faith in the almighty we. If you proselytize only the doom side of collapse reality, expect to be shunned. And most people will crave distraction and virtually anything that offers hope. And elite universities, the IPCC, the mainstream media, and politicians will remain first-rate legal hopium dealers. And again, related to number six, as our biospheric and societal predicament worsens, it doesn't mean every individual. My emotional health actually has increased, but it comes only from accepting. You have to accept what's inevitable to not go crazy. So again, these are the benefits of collapse acceptance. Clarity over confusion, compassion over blame, and love and action over activism. This reprioritizes nearly everything around what matters most and also what doesn't. It's kind of like getting a terminal diagnosis that reprioritizes your entire life and what you're going to spend the rest of your life, however short, on. A calm urgency to get complete with self, family, others, life, and legacy. Focuses attention on home, family, community, what's local, what's joyful, what's meaningful. Freedom from shoulds, oughts, have tos, and freedom for coulds, mights, get tos. An overwhelming gratitude for the gift of simply being alive, aware, and able to feel deeply. And an expanded sense of self or identity and of impermanence and death as sacred. And as I mentioned before, I just posted this the other day, 
Karen Perry post doom benefits of collapse acceptance. Karen is also the one who leads the women's circle, the post doom bloom women's circle. So this has been a lot. So if you're going to introduce somebody else to these 10 inevitables, I encourage you to either introduce them via the appetizer, the short one, half hour, or the mid-sized meal. Um, but this is where I have as much as I have to offer. This is, this is the most important video I think I've ever created. Thank you.